Hi, I'm Peter J. Ray. Welcome to Adventures in History. Today's topic is William Henry Harrison, Part 3, Tippy Canoe and Tyler Two. We stopped last time in 1840, the uh, very uh, entertaining, amazing election, presidential election of 1840, in which the uh, Whig candidate was William Henry Harrison, uh, who faced the Democratic candidate, Martin Van Buren. <coughs> Probably the most fun uh, campaign in American history, certainly for that era. It was a real spectacle, really incredible, incredibly entertaining, and folks really had a good time. And that's a large reason why Harrison won, because his campaign was so much fun. One of the things the uh, Harrison uh, campaign did, or was done, the large campaign balls were rolled, were rolled from town to town, generally made out of heavy paper, <clears throat> One was made out of tin, 12 feet in diameter, <clears throat> rolled from Cleveland to Columbus. Another one was made out of cowhide, pulled by a team of oxen. In May of 1840, there was another Whig convention in Baltimore, a monster parade, three miles long, and this huge, ba a huge ball, a Tippy Canoe and Tyler II ball, was rolled from the Maryland frontier. 3,000 banners and plenty of log cabin floats. The uh, log cab cabin one, it was one of the symbols of the election. Of course, uh, in frontiers, people built log cabins. Uh, that's the best they could do. You know, cut down a tree and you'd, you'd, the, 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 the walls of the cabin were, would be made out of logs. And uh, so this was actually pretty common all over. And, you know, a lot of common people had, been, had lived in log cabins. During the campaign, it was important to have a log cabin connection. Daniel Webster admitted that he was not born in a log cabin, but his elder siblings had been, and he said, quote, That cabin I annually visit, and thither carry my children. And when I or they forget that cabin and what it teaches and recalls, may my name and theirs perish from among, from among men forever." Well, you know, the log cabin really symbolized pioneer life, hard work, and um, the common man, the life of the common man, and ha ha hacking or beginning their lives on the frontier by building building homes from from the logs of, of trees. There were uh, stories that William Henry Harrison's home in the Cincinnati area was always open to old soldiers, and I think that was pretty true because he was he really cared about them, and of course he. He had a military career, so he was interested in their welfare. Representative Charles o Ogle made a speech on behalf of the Whigs, and he said that Martin Van Buren, who was the incumbent president running for re-election, the president Martin Van Buren was was eating off of fancy was eating fancy French meals off of gold plates, admiring himself in go in gold framed mirrors in the White House, and that the White House. Uh, yard or lawn had been landscaped with mounds, as Ogle said, quote, every pair of which was designed to resemble an Amazon's bosom, with a miniature knoll or hillock at its apex to, to denote the nipple. Uh, the White House, according to Charles Ogle, was a palace as splendid as that of the Caesars and as richly adorned as the proudest Asiatic mansion. So they were trying to create this uh, idea that you know Martin Van Buren was the wealthy man living living luxuriously, and and William Henry Harrison was the common man. During the campaign, they had the Tippy Canoe Quick Step Dance at the at a William Henry Harrison hoedown, new dance step for the campaign. One of the ironies is that Harrison himself was very much against drinking because of what he had seen in the military, all of the alcohol. He'd seen the uh, effects of alcoholism, the tragedy. So many people, so many men he knew in the military, in the army, destroyed by al alcoholism. And also his family. He had alcoholism among his sons. So he, was a, he personally was very much against alcohol. However, his campaign promoted hard cider uh, booze. You know, it was, it, was like, it was an alcoholic campaign with all kinds of drinking going on. Fermented apple juice, uh, of course, which is which was a common alcoholic beverage on the frontier. People could, you know, buy, make apple cider or let it, you know, let it ferment. And it becomes, a, if you keep apple cider too long, it becomes alcoholic. 
There were log cabins raised in many towns, which became centers of Whig activity, part of the campaign, having log cabins. And the Washington Globe called these log cabins that were raised in towns and uh, called, called these, quote, groggeries, where Harrisonians became debauched with liquor. So a lot of drunkenness in the campaign. The New York State Temperance Society leader, or a leader, uh, fighting for, uh, to, to ban, Ill, to make alcohol illegal, uh, wrote, quote, Within three or four months, intemperance has become a badge of political party. Yeah, so the Whig campaign had all this drinking going on, and, and the, Harrison himself was very much against drinking. In Lancaster, Pennsylvania, Democrats threw stones and broke several holes in the Tippy Canoe and Tyler II ball. Now, a, a supporter of, 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 of Billy Harrison, William Henry Harrison, was Jane Field from Fayette County, Illinois, who wrote, quote, When the war whoop on our prairies was the infant's lullaby, our mothers reposed in security, for Harrison was our protector. Going back to, uh, yeah, the gratitude people felt for Harrison in fighting Indians and defeating Indians and making it safe for settlers on the, on the frontier so they wouldn't have to be afraid of Indian attacks. A Democratic paper wrote about Harrison and called him, quote, a living mass of ruined matter. Well, he was 68 years old. He was getting older. There was another uh, William Henry Harrison jingle went like this, quote, Though gray be his locks, there's fire in his eye that flashes in scorn when a foeman is nigh. Harrison, Billy Harrison was gregarious. He put folks at ease and made an excellent and personal impression on others. Uh, Martin Van Buren's vice presidential candidate, Richard Johnson, was such an ardent campaigner that it was reported that he was accused of starting a riot in Cleveland, Ohio. Another Democratic newspaper wrote uh, against uh, Harrison, quote, General Harrison was always a coward, always a foe to the people, always as rapacious as Verus, that was a corrupt uh, ancient Roman general, and as infamous as Benedict Arnold. We know not whether most to scorn his imbecility, to hate his principles, or wonder at his impudent effrontery. <clears throat> Another uh, critic of, or supporter of Van Buren, a Democrat, Isaac Crary, who was a representative in the House of Representatives, wrote about William Henry Harrison, calling him, quote, the greatest egotist that ever wrote the English language. Now, a Whig, Tom Corwin, wrote about Crary. It was a, he was a peacetime general and wrote about Crary and his sword, this is an aside, and called him, and with an energy and remorseless fury, he slices the watermelons that lie in heaps around him. So uh, Crary, uh, that quote of haunted Crary, who was, ended up being called the Watermelon G General, and reportedly his political career was over after that. During the campaign, William Henry Harrison was called our champion general and our brave defender. There was a third-party candidate, Liberty Party presidential candidate James G. Burney, promoted recognition of Haitian independence. Haiti was an independent country in the, in the Caribbean, uh, the western third of the island of Hispaniola, and ruled by uh, African descent Haitians who had fought for independence against France. And he said, quote, The Haitians are black, and to treat a nation of blacks as free would lead the slave of the South into some knowledge of his dignity as a man. In the election, when the voters went to the polls, there were one million more voters in 1840 than in 1836. So there was a continued expansion of democracy and, and uh, uh, making it easier for folks to vote, the removal of property requirements to vote. William Henry Harrison received 1.27 million votes, Martin Van Buren 1.13. This was called the first modern presidential election. Harrison won big in the Electoral College. He won 234 votes, uh, Van Buren only 60. 80% 80 of voters voted. Now, as we said, during the campaign, there were these huge uh, eight-foot or more diameter paper balls, heavy paper balls, that were rolled, being rolled around the country. This was a big, this was a big thrill in small towns when the, when the Tippecanoe and Tyler II ball arrived in town. Big excitement, and then they kept, and then it would come into town, and then 
spend some time, and the ball would ro- roll on to the next town. And they co- the uh, slogan was, keep the ball rolling to Washington. And this is where we have the expression, to keep the ball rolling, comes from the 1840 U.S. presidential campaign. Reportedly, women participated in the Whig campaign, although they couldn't vote, but not in the Democratic campaign. So that probably helped them, although not sure how much they enjoyed all that drinking. Tippy Canoe and Tyler, too, so that they won. Harrison and Tyler won. And William Henry Harrison was elected the ninth U.S. president in a circus-like campaign, the Log Cabin Campaign. He was, he was really marketed. He was, they called him a, he was called a simple man who lived in a log cabin and drank hard cider. Philadelphia distiller E.C. Booz, this is fellow's last, last name was B-O-O-Z, he sold whiskey in log cabin-shaped bottles. And this is where we get the word booze from, the, from that fellow whose name was E.C. Booz. So it was victory for the Whigs and Harrison and Tippy Canoe and Tyler, too. Ed, Edward P. Crapple wrote about the 1840 election, quote, Roughly 80% of the eligible male electorate went to the polls. Energized by massive parades, outdoor rallies, campaign songs, and and a circus like hoopla never before witnessed by the American public. Even one Democratic editor candidly admitted he found the Whig song fests unforgettable and said the melodies, quote, rang in my ears wherever I went morning, noon, and night, as men, women, and children did nothing but sing. And this is still remembered to this day. Back in the 1960s, when I was growing up, they had in Rocky River, Ohio, they had Rocky River Day, and we were supposed to have a float. And my mother had studied American history, and she we had a float, we had a we had a canoe, and a we had a, a, a stuffed uh, a Snoopy doll, and we had this float, Tippy Canoe and Snoopy too, and the the the, the, the canoe, and we put the canoe on this uh, wagon. And so the, it was kind of tippy. So that we, it was anyway. My mom came up with that years later. I realized where she came up with that idea. Again, in the Electoral College, Harrison won big, two thirty-four to sixty. However, only one hundred forty-five thousand more in the popular vote. Eighty percent turnout of the voters. So people, big turnout after the election. Henry Clay, who was the leader of the Whig Party, said about Harrison, "Quote." I think the strength of his mind is unabated, but his body is a good deal shattered. Now, immediately after the election, Harrison was besieged by job seekers at home, people looking for government jobs. He fled to Kentucky for refuge, trying to get away from all these people. And then by, by uh, 1840, early 1841, he traveled to, to Washington he arrived on February 9th in Washington, his 68th birthday. So he was... He was an old guy. Now, before leaving Cincinnati, he spoke to a crowd and said, quote, Gentlemen and fellow citizens, perhaps this may be the last time I may have the pleasure of speaking to you on earth or seeing you. I will bid you for farewell. If forever, fare thee well. And yeah, he never saw them again he, because he died uh, in Washington. His wife, Anna, after the election said, quote, I wish that my husband's friends had left him happy and contented in retirement. So she was not happy about him becoming president, especially at age 68. So he, uh, Harrison was off to Washington from Cincinnati. He took a, a steamboat, a riverboat on the Ohio River to Pittsburgh, and then a land trip to Washington with many stops. Lots of people wanted to meet Harrison, especially the, all the excitement from the campaign. Big crowds, receptions, lots of handshaking, all kinds of visitors. Martin Van Buren said this about Harrison, quote, He talks and thinks with much ease and vivacity. A representative, Henry Wise, wrote about Harrison. He, he said that Harrison, quote, had a, quote, a total derangement of his nervous system. By this time, before by the time he got to Washington, he had sh- he had shook shook so many hands that his arm got so tired he couldn't shake anymore, and he was really wearing out. Uh, it was reported Philip Hone, a fellow named Philip Hone, was, saw passing through through the crowd on Pennsylvania Avenue early in early in 1841. Quote: An elderly gentleman in black and not remarkably dressed, with a mild benignant countenance. A military air, but stooping a little, bowing to one, shaking hands with another, and cracking jokes with a third. 
and this man was William Henry Harrison, unattended and unconscious of the dignity of his, his position, his sub- simplicity a sublime moral spectacle. Again, Harrison was an intellectual. He was a warrior intellectual, kind of unusual. Daniel Webster, who was a top Whig uh, politician, uh, edited the, his inaugural address you know, Harrison prepared his speech for his inauguration, and then and then uh, Webster edited it and reportedly deleted uh, many classical allusions to uh, Harrison loved uh, ancient history, especially ancient Greece and Rome. And uh, uh, unfortunately, I think Webster removed many of these references from his speech. And Daniel Webster boasted that he had killed quote seventeen Roman proconsuls as dead as smelts. Every one of them. I think that was too bad. But anyway, that's what he did. And the big, uh, big challenge, again, this pressure for people looking for jobs. He was the, Harrison was the first Whig president. On Mar- March 4th, he rode his f- favorite horse, Whitey, to the Capitol for the inauguration. The Democratic newspaper called Harrison, quote, a superannuated and pitiable dotard. Now, his, inaugura- his inauguration was March 4th, 1841. He was 68 years old. People said he was too old, so he, he, he wanted to show that he, uh, that, he ha- that he had strength and health. And even though it was a cold and rainy day, he did not wear a hat or gloves or an overcoat. And he gave this long speech, an hour and 40 minutes. And one of the things he said was, quote, Of all the great interests which appertain to our country, that of union, cordial, confiding, fraternal union, is by far the most important, since it is the only true and sure guarantee of all others. He's talking about the union of the states and uh, the threat of, well, the problem with the threat of disunion, which, of course, eventually this, in the Civil War, that's what happened. So he's hoping we, he's trying to say, we need to stay together. Uh, another, uh, qu- another good quote from his inaugural address. He talked about the danger to liberty, the danger to freedom from the love of power among men, about how people, individual men, or, and today women, have a love of power. And this is a threat to the, to the freedom of the people. And Harrison said, quote, This is the old trick of those who would usurp the government of their country. In the name of democracy they speak warning the people against the influence of wealth and the danger of aristocracy. History, ancient and modern, is full of such examples. Julius Caesar became the master of the Roman people and the Senate under the pretense of supporting the democratic claims of the former against the aristocracy of the latter. Oliver Cromwell, in the character of protector of the liberties of the people, became the dictator of England. And Simon Bolivar possessed himself of unlimited power with the title of his country's liberator. In the Roman Senate, Octavius had a party and Mark Antony a party, but the Commonwealth had none. Yet the Senate continued to meet in the Temple of Liberty to talk of the sacredness and beauty of the Commonwealth and gaze at the statues of the elder Brutus and of the Curti and Decai and the people assembled in the Forum, not as in the days of Camillus, and the Scipios to cast their free votes for annual magistrates or pass upon the acts of the Senate, but to receive from the hands of the leaders of the respective parties their share of the spoils, and to shout for one or the other, as those collected in Gaul or Egypt and the lesser Asia would furnish the larger dividend. The spirit of liberty had fled, and avoiding the abodes of civilized man, had sought protection in the wilds of Scythia or Scandinavia. There exists in the land a spirit hostile to the people's best interests, hostile to liberty itself. The entire remedy is with the people. Wonderful, wonderful speech and uh, wonderful ancient Greek and Roman references, and I think it's still applicable to it today, that in any country, in any time, that the, da- the threat to liberty comes from the uh, love of power among, among individuals. Now, one thing that uh, Harrison faced immediately, he refused to, d- to dismiss Democrats in government and to give jobs to Whigs. This led to immediate conflict with Henry, Henry Clay. Clay thought he could bully Harrison, and he found out very quickly that he could not. And they had a confrontation, and Harrison kicked Clay out of the White House and said, quote, you are too impetuous. Harrison was, 
William Hen President Harrison, uh, during his one month early on in his uh, presidency, complained of headaches and said that he was, quote, bothered almost to death with visitors. I have not time to attend to my person, not even to change my shirt, much less to attend to the public business. I must leave this house. I must go and lock myself up somewhere where I can have some peace and be exempted from these interruptions. So he was having a tough time early on. He got sick on March 26th, about only uh, three weeks after the inaugur being inaugurated. He had got a cold, pneumonia, and pleurisy. Medical care was really terrible at that time. The, the treatment he received included opium, castor oil, leeches, and snake weed, as well as bleeding when you know they would open a guy up to remove blood, and then cupping where they would burn the person trying to, in their belief, trying to draw the disease to the surface of the body. Uh, William Henry Harrison died April 4th, 1841, exactly one month after his inauguration. He was 68 years old, and he was succeeded by his vice president, John Tyler. Before he died, his last words were to his doctor, in which he said, quote, Sir, I wish to understand the true principles of government. I wish them carried out. I ask nothing more. After President Harrison's death, a former Indian agent, John Johnston, wrote about the Wyandotte Indians, quote, They had promised themselves much from his administration. Their confidence in his justice and humanity was unbounded. Poor fellows, his death fell upon them like the thunder which prostrates the loftiest oak. If the Indians had the privilege of voting in that last election for president, no one could be found to blackball their old and faithful friend, William Henry Harrison. The funeral procession was on April 7th. His uh, Harrison's horse, Whitey, was a riderless symbol of the fallen leader. Bells were The bells tolled, cannons fired. There was a mile-long procession. His funeral was held in the, uh, there was an Episcopal funeral in the East Room of the White House. After his death, uh, his widow, Anna, said, quote, Mingling my tears with the sighs of the many patriots of the land, I pray to heaven for the enduring happiness and prosperity of our beloved country. Now, Andrew Jackson, on the other hand, who was uh, Democratic, uh, so who supported Van Buren, uh, was, uh, was, was happy about the death of Harrison. Jackson said, quote, A kind and overruling providence has interfered to prolong our glorious union and happy Republican system, which General Harrison and his cabinet were preparing to destroy under the direction of the profligate demagogue Henry Clay. The Lord ruleth. Let our nation rejoice. The following year, 1842, Harrison's daughter Mary died at age 33. Died very young as well. Uh, now, in 1843 as well, the Wyandotte Indians were the last Indians to be removed from Ohio and transported west to Indian reservations. They traveled by steamer on a steamboat on the Ohio River. And when they passed, uh, the boat passed William Henry Harrison's grave, which was near the river. And they all stood in silent respect for Billy, General Billy Harrison. Their chief said, quote, Farewell, Ohio, and her brave. So you can see the Indian respect for, for, for William Henry Harrison. 1845, his daughter Anna died at age 33. 1846, his daughter Elizabeth died at age 50. 1864, his widow Anna died at age 88. And in 1878, his son John Scott died at age 74. In 1924, there was a 100-foot stone shaft monument erected at Harrison's tomb and dedicated uh, by the Ohio River in North Bend, Ohio. In 1931, Ripley's Believe It or Not published a story. They, they, they reported that since, since Harrison, every president elected after, in a 20-year interval, interval, died in office. So, so Harrison, who was elected in 1840, died. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, elected in 1860, he died in office. James Garfield in 1880. William McKinley in 1900. Uh, Garfield and McKinley, both they were shot and killed. Warren Harding in 1920, who got sick and died. Franklin D. Roosevelt in 1940, he died of illness. And John F. Kennedy in 1960, who was shot and killed. 
of course, ninth, that that was the end. Nineteen eighty, Ronald Reagan was uh, was shot but survived. They call and Ripley's believe it, believe it or not called this the Curse of Tecumseh. Now, one of the biographers of Harrison was Gail Collins, who wrote a biography of Harrison for the American President series for Times Books. And she was working on this, and she told her friends what she was doing. They said, well, why are you writing a, a biography of a guy who was only president for one month? And she said, well, she grew up in the Cincinnati area, and as a girl in school, she wrote a uh, paper about uh, Harrison, William Henry Harrison, and then it apparently it was a very good paper, so there was a, a ceremony, an event, where she read out loud her paper. And her people were there, including her parents. And her the last line she, in her speech, she said, "And he had a big house." And then her father said, "Yeah, he had a very big house." And, and she said, "Well, how, how do you know that?" And he said, "Well, because I tore it down." And then he told the story. His her father, Gail Collins' father, worked for the Cincinnati Gas and Electric Company, and over time they acquired property. And then and it turns out that the Harrison Mansion was in the middle of this property, in the middle of a power plant, and it needed to be. It was. It was in the way. So they uh, they they tried to have it move, but there wasn't enough financial support from histor- a historical society to move. It takes some money to move a move a house. So they ended up tearing it down, and he had that responsibility. And sure, of course, she felt kind of bad about it. And, it, and ended up agreeing to, to, to write this uh, biography uh, of William Henry Harrison. Now, for, this, uh, to, for these uh, three videos, I read three books, uh, William Henry Harrison by Gail Collins, 2012, The Frontierman by Alan W. Eckert, 1967, and Old Tippy Canoe by William Henry, William Henry Harrison and His Time by Freeman Cleves, 1939. So in conclusion, uh, William Henry Harrison lived an amazing life. He was a, a great Indian fighter. He fought American Indians, which was something that uh, a, a, a painful re- reality in American history. But somebody had to do it because the Indians were fighters. They didn't just lie over and give up their land. And William Henry Harrison faced Tecumseh, who was one of the greatest American Indians fighters trying to stop American expansion. And Harrison was the uh, leader at the Battle of Tippecanoe, Indiana, in which uh, Tecumseh's forces were defeated. And at the Battle of the Thames River in Ontario, Canada, in the War of 1812, when Tecumseh died. And uh, along with that, Harrison, now the thing is, he had... he fought Indians, but he also respected them, and he, he, he did the best he could for them. Yes, he negotiated for their lands, but he also was a friend. As soon as they were defeated, he was a friend of American Indians, did the best he could based, uh, based on the political realities of his time. And he also did an awful lot for American veterans who often are forgotten by the public and who need, who need their veterans and their families need, need, need financial help. Uh, because of being disabled from war. He also did a lot for the infrastructure of Ohio, which was very important for economic development and to help farmers get their, get their crops to, uh, to market. He was a good man, very good man. God bless William Henry Harrison, a man who served his country well. Well, that concludes today's presentation. I hope you have a good history book to read or, or can find one. There's so many amazing, wonderful history books that have been written are ready to be read. Uh, you might consider checking out our website, Adventures in History with Peter J. Ray at peterjray.com. So far, we've made 575 history videos in seven areas. World history, American history, book reviews, poetic tours, uh, Cleveland baseball, family history, and autobiography. You also might consider checking out our podcast, Adventures in History, which you can, which you can listen to on Spotify, Breaker, Google Podcasts, and Radio Public. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. God bless you. Take care. And I'll see you next time.